people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. That's the bad guy. start with this. Michaela Mayer's first comments, her reaction to the news that Alicia Baumgartner has tested positive for a banned substance. A lot of people were waiting for this. I feel sorry for her. Michaela Mayer breaks her silence on Alicia Baumgartner's positive drug test. Now that news broke 11 days ago, close to two weeks, and it's taken that amount of time for Michaela Mayer to break her silence. The test was taken on July 12th, three days before Baumgartner's rematch win with Christina Lenardatu, and the results were returned on August 12th, long after the fight took place. When the news broke, many fans were immediately awaiting Mayer's response as she shared a heated and entertaining rivalry with Boom Gartner, exchanging plenty of trash talk before their fight last year. There have been no new developments aside from Michaela Mayer reacting to the news 11 days after it broke. There have been no new developments, though it's conceivable that Alicia Baumgartner may be stripped of all the titles she currently holds at Super Featherweight, that is, unless she can find a way to clear her name. If she can't, she may be stripped of those titles, not dissimilar from what we saw we saw a few years ago with Alejandra Jimenez after she beat French on Cruz. Alejandra tested positive for a banned substance and was subsequently stripped of the titles thereafter, and the decision was overturned. Michaela Mayer's reaction. Every Everyone was coming at me expecting something may have told talk sport, explaining why she did not react to the news when it broke. But our trash talk before had a purpose. It's for rivalry and excitement. To me, this was a big deal. This is a very serious topic for the sport. Very serious allegations for her part. I felt like it needed to be addressed more professionally. I knew I had a fight coming up and I knew I would be sitting here being asked this very question. So I figured I'd wait to address it and see how things played out in the meantime. Took her long enough. My honest opinion is I found Michaela Mayer's silence on the whole thing the last 11 days a bit unsettling. Surely she has an opinion. Surely she has something to say. She has a lot to say about Alicia any other time. Why not now? Wow. wow. It's obviously wow. very disappointing, especially being another female in that weight class. Let me start off by saying that I'm suspicious of everyone in the sport. Those of you that follow this channel will know the last couple of years, my stance on doping in the sport of boxing has changed a bit and it seems to me like there are more boxers doping than perhaps the fans realize that when you hear that it's widespread that's an understatement and I don't put nothing past nobody when Connor Ben tested positive Chris Eubank jr. who he was supposed to be fighting didn't seem at all broken up about it even though he was killing himself to make the wait for that fight he didn't seem at all bothered by it and I found that unsettling that you were about to share the ring with this guy and it doesn't bother you that he was on Ben's substance uh -huh. Unless you might have been on some yourself, just different ones than him. Different ones than the ones he's using. I even heard that he was trying to go through with the fight, go through with it anyway. What kind of message does that send? What does that tell you? You always wonder how long she has been doing that, she being Alicia Baumgartner. Was this the first time, or was this the first time she got caught? A lot of questions now, and I feel sorry for her, because her career, her legacy, this, this is her legacy now. She's got to figure it out on her own. That's her problem. I'm not in her weight class anymore. I'm not thinking about Alicia Baumgartner anymore. So she's got to worry about clearing her name. Based on that, I get the sense that Michaela doesn't want, feels that she doesn't need a rematch with Alicia anymore because Alicia's legacy is now tainted. To me, it's not something I would ever think of doing, so I just sort of assumed that other people weren't doing it, but I didn't realize how common it was. It's just showing up over and over and over again in the last year. I think everybody's realizing this like, damn, 
it's a much bigger problem than we all expected. I just hope they crack down and start instilling a lot more fear in athletes. The old cynic in me has grown distrustful of most everyone because who's lying and who's telling the truth? Whenever somebody gets popped, it's the same song and dance. It's the same uniform response. I didn't do nothing. I don't know how that got there. When the guys get popped, when the girls get popped, it's the same deal. It's always the same thing. So who can you trust? That anyone from a Canelo Alvarez to a Tyson Fury, high profile fighters, and more recently, Hannah Gabriels, Alicia Baumgartner, two reigning champions. Zola, a former champion. Zola, it's so widespread. It's so common now, so common to hear that you start to feel it's not really a question of who's using, it's a question of who isn't. Seems like everybody is. It needs to be more than just a slap on the wrist, Michaela Mayer said. It needs to be like serious repercussions so people are afraid and they are very, very careful about what they put into their body. Because all of this took place on U.S. soil, I don't think the repercussions for Alicia are going to be all that harsh as they seldom ever are in this country when it comes to doping fiascos. I anticipate she may be issued a year ban downgraded to a six-month ban provided she cooperates with an investigation, sits out the rest of this year, and returns the following year up there at lightweight after having been stripped, possibly having been stripped of all her titles at super featherweight because if she can't clear her name, that's what might happen. That's what happened to Alejandra Jimenez. In terms of clearing her name, we've heard very little in reference to to that outside of an official statement from Alicia saying that she's innocent. She didn't knowingly cheat. She didn't knowingly take any banned substances. My thoughts. Michaela Mayer's not pursuing a rematch with her anymore. This has tainted Alicia Baumgartner's legacy. People won't hesitate to bring it up whenever she's around to take jabs at her. Michaela Mayer asks, how long has she been doing this? Is this the first time or is this just the first time that she got caught? That frame of mind can be applied to their fight that they had. Sounds like that's what Michaela Mayer's doing, and she's not losing any sleep over Alicia anymore. This may help to lessen the blow. Michaela, having suffered her first career loss to Alicia Baumgartner, whose legacy, in her own words, is now tainted, she probably feels she doesn't need a second fight. She doesn't need her. Onward and upward. Set to return to action this weekend on the undercard of Eubank Jr. versus Smith, too. She's going to be facing Italy's own Sylvia Bortot. Then after that, she means to to move up and wait again for a Natasha Jonas fight. In Michaela's own mind, she doesn't need to fight Alicia anymore. She doesn't need that rematch. Alicia has her own problems, and Michaela is moving on. Men's lightweight news, Javante Davis's trainer, Tank would whoop Sean O'Malley's ass in one round. Sean O'Malley. He's an MMA fighter. Not only is Javante Tank Davis getting called out by many of the top boxers in the sport, he's also become a target for MMA fighters as well. The UFC's newest star, world champion Sugar Sean O'Malley, has called for a boxing match with Javante Davis. After a stunning second round stoppage of some guy named Sterling at UFC 292, two, which took two, place two. earlier this month, O'Malley took part in a post-event press conference and surprised many in attendance by calling for a fight with Davis. That might actually happen, a crossover fight between them. Gervonta Davis is rumored to be facing Isaac Cruz for the second time later on this year in a pointless rematch that no one is asking for. In place of a fight with a Devin Haney or a Shakur Stevenson, maybe moving up in weight to pursue a fight with Tio Fimo, he's fighting that guy again. And it's all very predictable. Ice told you, if he don't end up fighting Isaac again, maybe he'll fight Roley. Roley's got O'Hara Davies problems with the WBA, which leaves Isaac. But if he fights Isaac and he beats Isaac, what do you think he's going to do after that? You're expecting him to pursue a fight with Shakur or Devin or Teofimo? No. What am I knocking out Javante Davis? I'm telling you that fight is going to happen. I would love to go out there and box him. I don't know if he's a big enough star for the UFC to let that happen, but it will happen, O'Malley said. One of Davis's trainers, Kenny Ellis, believes O'Malley would get destroyed in a boxing match. Tank's going to whoop his ass in the first round. Any tiny light weight would beat him. Tank, Shakur, Haney, all those guys would beat him because they're all boxers. All of them would knock him out. You better leave those boxers alone before you get knocked out, Ellis told ES News. O'Malley's call-out is not surprising. In truth, these kinds of call-outs between what are MMA fighters and boxers... Paul, for of course, now it's commonplace. Ever since the big crossover fight between Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor and all of the money they made, those two giants of industry at that time, more and more mixed martial artists have been in 
endeavoring into the world of boxing because they know in the world of boxing they stand to make a lot more money than what they're making in mixed martial arts. Got guys like Tyrone Woodley, Ben Askren going as far as boxing social media influencers in the squared circle in the boxing ring because they know they stand to make more money as boxers, even inexperienced boxers, than what they've been making as MMA fighters. Anyone with two functioning brain cells could look at Conor McGregor's fight with Floyd or Ben Askren's fight, Tyrone Woodley's fight with Jake Paul and see that these guys don't belong in a boxing ring. And what it really is is just the cash grab behind the guise of a crossover that really isn't a legitimate crossover. It's not like these guys are trying to build themselves up to one day fight for a world title in the sport of boxing. It's a one and done kind of deal. That's what these things are. Most of the time it's some MMA fighter, some UFC guy at the end of his career and at the end of his contract looking to make a couple of bucks like what we just saw with Jake Paul and Nate Diaz. You think about Tyson Fury and Francis Ngannou's crossover fight set to go down later on this year in October on the 28th. Tyson Fury is a reigning champion, you understand. A sitting champion, currently in possession of an alphabet title. And instead of fighting somebody in the World Boxing Council's rank standing, he's boxing a guy that ain't ever boxed before. The comfortability level to stage these kinds of events on the boxing side of it, the MMA side of it, on both sides. It's grown. There's a lot to be criticized when it comes to Fury versus Nganu. Instead of focusing on making history in your own sport, your legacy in your own sport, you're participating in a shameless cash grab with a guy that probably don't belong in a boxing ring. Gary should be fighting Usyk and Francis Ngannou should be fighting John Bones Jones. So when I think about what's been going on the last couple of years, what we've been seeing, what we're set to see, and this latest news that Sean O'Malley would like to endeavor into the world of boxing to take on Gervonta Davis of all people and thinking about Gervonta Davis and how his career has been, how he has quite shamelessly. He's been avoiding the best fight is anywhere in between 130, 135, and 140 for years. That's why he's fighting Isaac Cruz again instead of somebody else. Yeah. Somebody better. And after he takes care of business with that guy, if he does take care of business and nothing strange happens, what do you think? He's going to pursue a fight with Shakur Stevenson or Devin Haney? No. Teofimo? No. I'd sooner expect him to fight Sean O'Malley in a circus fight than any one of them. I would. Because this is right up his alley and he's not a competitor. He's not that kind of fighter and he never was it's not wired that way he's all about the most rewards for the least risks not saying that there aren't a lot of boxers who would take up an mma fighter on their offer to cross over into boxing to make a fuck ton of money there are a lot of fighters that would they would but they haven't shamelessly avoided their contemporaries as frequently as Gervonta Davis. He didn't fight the best fighters at 130, 135 at 140, and I don't think he's about to. I'd sooner expect him to fight Sean O'Malley in a circus fight next year after the Isaac Cruz fight, the one nobody's asking for. And his fans are going to justify it behind how much money stands to make, as if that makes it any less of a circus fight, a novelty act. It's entirely possible that Gervonta Davis will elect to fight in a crossover fight with Sean O'Malley on the premise that commercially it it would do better than a Shakur Stevenson fight or a Devin Haney fight, even though he's supposed to be some kind of cash cow. So why should he have to resort to fighting MMA fighters? Because he's not as big a cash cow as they say he is. Look, he could do decent buys with Shakur and he could do decent buys with Devin, but those are riskier fights, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Much riskier than fighting an MMA fighter, certainly riskier than the Ryan Garcia fight was. And that was the biggest fight commercially that he could have had at or around these weights. Yeah. That fight has come and gone. There ain't no more fights like that. Shakur Stevenson, Devin Haney, Tio Fimo, they have a lot more ability than Orion Garcia, but they're not as popular as he is. So what you have are less rewards and more risks. That situation, I think Gervonta Davis would quite shamelessly elect to circumvent fighting his contemporaries in his own sport to fight an MMA fighter for a cash grab. That's what I think, and it could happen. It all depends on Sean O'Malley. In men's welterweight news, Terrence Crawford believes Derek James is a great coach, but did a bad job on July 29th, his long-awaited fight with Errol Spence Jr., and how 
Errol performed under Derek James's watchful eye all the things that Derek said ahead of the fight and all the things that took place during the fight. Errol got his ass kicked. Derek James did a lot of disrespect to my coach, said Crawford, on an episode of the Three Knockdown Rule. The media was disrespecting my coach. The fans, they were disrespecting my coach. But he showed high-level coaching the night of the fight. I don't think Derek James was on his level. He wasn't. Not to say that two things can't be true at the same time because they can. I myself think Derek James is actually a good coach, a very good coach with a very good stable. I even think Errol is a good fighter, just not on the level of Terence Crawford. He's too simple. What comments are coming back to haunt Derek James, haunt Errol Spence Jr., and haunt their supporters, their fans, is how dismissive and disrespectful they were of Terence Crawford the last five years, and dismissive and disrespectful of Brian Bomack McIntyre, Terence's longtime trainer. I believe they didn't have a backup plan. Him telling his fighter to step around and that's all he was telling him, that was bad coaching for that fight that night. Says Terence Crawford. In truth, the preparation for a fighter like Terence Crawford does not begin in just one camp, in one fight, for one night, because he didn't become the fighter that he is in just one camp, in one fight, for one night. It doesn't work like that. To be ready for a guy like Terence Crawford, the work it takes, that takes years, short of a fighter that is just too big for Terence, too big and too strong for Terence to work around with his ring savvy, his ring IQ, and his skills, short of an overwhelming size advantage. If we're talking about about two guys that are on an even playing field, right. on an even keel, to be ready for Terrence. It takes years of preparation because it took him years to become who he became. Pretty much. Not to say that Derek James is a bad coach at all because I wouldn't disrespect him by saying he's a bad coach. He's a great coach. He's done great things in the sport of boxing, but that night, he got out coach. Derek James, a two-time recipient, at least two times for Trainer of the Year. I don't actually think he's a bad trainer based on his fighter's failures. I don't actually think Errol's a bad fighter based on not being able to beat Terrence Crawford. I just think there was too much hype around him. Too much hype that he could not substantiate. You can be a good fighter and an overrated fighter at the same time. That's what I mean when I say that two things can be true at the same time, even if they seem like opposites. Yeah, Errol was good. He just wasn't on Terrence's level. And we found that out. For all the excuses that are being made for him, the reality of it is he's not on Terrence's level. He was never on Terrence's level. And it seems like his fans, most of all, found that out the hard way. That's why they're struggling now to wrap their minds around it, all the things they convinced themselves of. Derek can't turn him into a different fighter. Less news breaks by the time that this video is uploaded. He has until tomorrow to activate his rematch clause. I don't think he should. Uh -uh. Derek is not not a bad trainer based on Errol's limitations, and those limitations will still be there at 154 if they were to try to fight Terrence again. Those limitations would still be there. If they want it to be about weight more than anything else, or neurological damage more than anything else, time off more than anything else. He's gonna get hit with the same punch as he was getting hit with at 147 at 154. He's gonna be open for the same shots. The only hope is that because it's a healthier weight for him, he'll take the punch is better, but he's still gonna take them. He's gonna take a sustained beating. Errol's base style is too simple for Terence Crawford. His style is too textbook, too easy to read, too easy to counter. And I don't give Derek too much of a hard time for that because this is Terence Crawford we're talking about here. He's not an easy guy to deal with, not an easy guy to figure out, but that's the problem. Derek's not going to be able to figure him out. Neither will Errol. Mm -mm. They're out of their depth when it comes to this one, when it comes to this fighter. And it really is as simple as that.